Hi, everyone. It is 10 o'clock. Welcome. I'm so glad to see everyone. I'm sure people will continue to come in as we start, but we're going to go ahead and um, get started. So welcome, everyone, to our first poker norming session of the academic year. I hope you all had a great summer and that you're all rested and ready for um, everything that's coming this semester for you, um, including poker reviews. Um, all right, so um, the session is from 10 to 12. I'll go over uh, the agenda sort of in just a little bit. And let me go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Sochil Tirado. I am um, with CVC, I, keep, I always forget my title. I'm a faculty, I think I'm a faculty, faculty mentor. <laughs> mentor. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm a faculty mentor for CVC and I focus in uh, in poker with CVC at one. And uh, Maria Elena is here as well. So I'm going to let her go ahead and introduce herself. My name is Maria Elena Fernandez and I'm um, also with CVC and I support um, Sochi in um, the faculty mentor poker area. And I'm, a, I'm in DE and instructional design at College of the Siskiyou. So once again, welcome everyone. And Marilena and I are here not only for this session, but we're here to help you with anything poker related. Um, you can email us um, and we will get back to you with uh, your poker questions or your poker needs. All right, so um, today we're gonna focus on section B, um, interaction. I'm also gonna talk about RSI. So I have a lot of information to kind of give to you guys about that. Um, we do have some college spotlights. That'll be the second hour. We have two different colleges that are going to be presenting on different poker topics, and then we'll wrap it up at noon. Um, here are the dates for our upcoming norming sessions. Please go ahead and um, mark those dates. We do send out uh, the invitation about a month before each of the norming sessions, so you guys can start um, sharing those with your team and you know signing up for those sessions. So. Um, that's what's coming up. And all the sessions are from, are from 10 to 12. And I do understand that, you know, some days don't work for everyone. It's really hard to pick days that work for every person um, in our system. But, you know, I try to alternate from Wednesday to Thursday. So hopefully that'll, that'll help some of us um, be able to attend. Um, the session is being recorded. Um, the recording will be available at our site, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, so if there's anybody on your team that couldn't make it, that you want to share the recording with, go ahead and send it to them uh, once it's posted on our website. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about our website right now. So we do have a new CBC at one site that I want to share with you. Um, we've It's been up and running for a couple of weeks. Um, and if you go to cvc.edu, I'll go ahead and show you. And I think I'm still sharing the right screen. Oh, but before I do, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need Marilena to drop in the attendance sheet. Uh, it's already done. I'm, oh, I'm gonna, perfect. I have to add, um, I think I need to add, or we need to add the uh, City College. I'm sorry, Los Angeles City College. They're not on the roster. So I'll, oh, I'll get okay. that taken care of. All right. So sorry about that. So uh, Marilena dropped the um, attendance sheet. So go ahead and just... Uh, scroll down to your college and type your name in. That gives us a good idea of who's here. Um, and we'll be dropping that, but then I will be dropping that a couple of times throughout the, the meeting. Okay, so anyway, back to our new poker site. So if you go to cvc.edu, I think that's this is a site that most of us um, know. Um, over here on the right, there's the educators click here. That takes you to another exchange site. But then over here on the right, you can just visit CVC at one. Um, so this is our new site. Everything is together, the um, at one trainings that we offer, as well as uh, information about poker. So if you click on poker, that's where you'll get the information about poker. And we kind of divided it into um, poker certified and non poker certified. Um, we're still working on the site. So the information there is good information, but we're still working on adding more information on this site. So bear with us as we continue to make those changes. Um, this is where you will eventually see today's recording as well as our past recordings for, from our other poker norming sessions. But again, it's still kind of a work in progress. But so the goal is for it to be easier to navigate and easier to find the information that you need. So 
go ahead and take a look at it. And as, as I said, we are continuing to improve that site and continuing to add resources for um, poker leads as well as reviewers. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and continue. Oh, I need to go back to my PowerPoint. There it is. All right, so as I said, today we're gonna talk about um, section B as well as RSI. Um, so I'm gonna go over um, just very briefly, I'm gonna talk about Title V. I'll talk about um, the new ACCJC rubric that's in pilot right now or will be in pilot soon. And then I'll talk about section B of our rubric and then kind of talk about how those are all tied together. Um, so before I start with um, Title V, I do wanna talk about um, our rubric and the fact that our rubric still has regular effective contact and there's no mention of regular substantive interaction. Um, we are fully aware that our rubric does not match the current language. We are trying to work towards an update, but um, Andrea, I think there's hope in the future. I don't know if you can say a little bit more. I don't think any of you were on the, the CBC advisory meeting yesterday, but Chad Funk, who works um, East Play, it's like educational support and a whole bunch of other words. Um, Chad shared with the advisory committee that the chancellor's office um, supports um, updating the rubric, revising it, and um, is really close to finalizing an agreement with us. So very exciting. Yeah, so hopefully we'll see some changes where the language is matching up more. Um, I've been working on this presentation for the last week and this week, and I you know, obviously noticed the differences in language. Um, so I'm going to go over that, but I do want to let you know that we are going to get to like actual norming topics. So, you know, bear with me. I want to talk about this first so that we can all kind of be on the same page as to what the requirements are and what the rubric has. And then we're going to go on to like real norming uh, conversations. Okay, so this is Title V. I obviously summarized it. I didn't put everything on the page, but it's still a lot of information. So Title V basically says... Um, that we need to have regular substantive interaction um, as described in our course outline of record or our D and, and or our DE addendum. So most of us have some sort of regular substantive interaction language in there. So we have to make sure we follow that. And then they go into detail about what subst substantive means, substantive means, and what regular interaction is. So, um, you know, I've been looking at this a lot in the last couple of days. So, you know, substantive is basically, there's the direct instruction, there's the feedback for the student's work. Um, we're providing information and responding to questions about the content. We're having group discussions about the content or facilitating them. And then there's the other activities and there's more to it than, than that. I do totally understand. I just kind of summarize it so we can just have like a snapshot. And then we have the regular interaction between a student and instructor. And then that's the providing interaction with students on a predictable and scheduled basis and monitoring students' academic engagement and success. So that's what basically Title V says. And then we have the ACCJC rubric that's a pilot. Like, let's not forget that. I think um, it's really important to understand that it's a pilot. And I'll talk a little bit about the survey that's still open and um, what, what we can do to provide details to this um, work group. So this rubric focuses again on the substantive interaction and the regular interaction. So it's pretty similar to Title V, I think. And of course, this is a rubric, so it has like different like criteria like that you can, that your college can meet or your college faculty can meet, right? But the substantive part is assessing or providing feedback on a student's work, providing information or responding to questions about content on the course competency, facilitating the group discussion regarding the content of the course, and then other instructional activities. And then we have the regular interaction, which is providing interaction with students on a predictable and regular basis, and then monitoring the student's academic engagement. So again, I feel like they're, this ACCJC rubric and Title V are are pretty similar, but then of course the rubric goes into more detail because there's different like 
ways that you can meet this and different criteria based on the rubric, right? Um, and then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about our course design rubric. And since today we're focusing on section B, I just focused this slide on section B. So section B is interaction, which seems to match up best with regular substantive interaction. Um, so we have different areas, B1 through B6. So we have the pre-course contact, the regular effective contact, the student initiated contact, the student initiated contact with other students, the regular effective contact among students, and then the participation levels. <clears throat> um, so a lot of interaction, I am aware, very different language. Um, I do feel that in the case of interaction with section B, we are going above and beyond what Title V says and what the ACCJC rubric says. Um, maybe those the language in those other two things, Title V and ACCJC, are more um, direct in a way, like, you know, you have to have like that regular interaction that's predictable, for example. We really don't have language that says predictable. We say like, yeah, you should reach out to your students. Your students should reach out to you. But the predictability is like, it, the language isn't there. So there are differences there, definitely. And I think the next slide is out of order. So I'm gonna skip it and I'll come back to it. <laughs> but um, I do wanna ask, um, well, I want to pose a question. What are the differences between RSI, ACCJC, and by RSI, I mean Title V, and the CVC rubric? So obviously, there's a lot of differences. Like I said, the language is very different. Um, I do feel that the CVC rubric, the spirit of it, matches what RSI and ACCJC says, um, but obviously in very different terms. So I do have kind of information for you guys. So this is my take on what the CVC rubric includes, and there's more. And this is where I'm saying like, okay, this matches what RSI says and the ACCJC rubric. So in A9, we talk about course design includes instructions for learners to work with content. So I think we're really specific in our rubric with like, we need to have instructions that are direct instructions for the students that the student really understands what the content, what they have to do with that content. Um, and again, there's other areas, but that's the one I wanted to point out. Then we have B2, which is the regular instructor initiated contact. Um, and then we, we, we have to, um, we ask instructors to provide an explanation of how that happens. So in B2, we're not saying like, it has to be consistent and constant, but I feel that that's, that, is kind of what we meant when B2 was created. And then we have B5, regular effective contact among students is designed to facilitate interaction at, um, with and about the course content. So here we're saying like, B5 is usually like, well, you have discussions that are focused on the content and that you're the one that's facilitating those discussions. And that's kind of what uh, Title V and ACCJC say. And then lastly, I put C7, course includes a clear description of how meaningful, timely feedback on assessments will be provided. Title V and ACCJC say that we need to provide students feedback, you know, of how they're doing. We need to keep track of their, you know, basically their success. So I feel like C7 matches that. So again, there's probably other areas in the rubric that match what Title V and the ACCJC rubric say. Um, but um, these are just the ones I wanted to highlight. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to this slide here. So this is um, the ACCJC pilot. They are asking for feedback. Um, so I just did a QR code. Um, but I do have do I have the website here? This is oh th this is just their rubric. Anyway, in their in the ACCJC website there is a link to this um, feedback form. I highly recommend that um, every one of us, especially poker leads, send us, send them their your feedback. Like, what do you think of the rubric? And there's like, obviously like specific questions that they want you to answer. So I do encourage that. Um, I don't know how you guys felt when this rubric came out, but I know that like, there seemed to be a lot of like, 
uncertainty and like worry. Um, I met with, so I'm a DE coordinator at Imperial Valley College. I met with my area DE coordinators that set everyone in San Diego and myself in Imperial Valley. And um, Jim Julius, you guys may know him. He was, he's part of that group. And he kind of brought some calm. He's like, don't forget, this is a pilot. They're taking our feedback. And, and I thought that was really important because I think as a group, we were like, oh, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to like make sure that our courses are meeting this? And it's still important to think that, but, you know, keeping in mind that it is a pilot and there were a lot of people, maybe some of you in this group that were part of that group that put this, that helped, that helped to give input, to put this rubric together. So they the seem ACCJC is working with people in the field. Um, and then again, they want our feedback. Okay. Um, so so just, before you, before you go on, um, there was a question um, um, in the chat about the ACCJC, the RSI rubric and uh, the CVC rubric um, about the updating issue. Would you like to address that? Sure. Is, it, is that the question kind of in a nutshell? Um, yeah, the question is, I would love if the CVC rubric, it's not a question, it's a statement. Uh, if the CVC rubric aligned with RSI, so we don't need to say REC. So I okay. totally agree with okay. you. Again, as I was putting together this presentation, I will share with you guys that there was a little level of anxiety for me. I was like, oh my goodness, it's so clear that they don't match. Like it's the language that doesn't match. Um, but as Andrea uh, mentioned earlier, it seems like we may be on the brink of some revision. We've been asking um, the chancellor's office for a while now for us to give us an opportunity to revise the rubric, to form a work group that we can look at the rubric, we can look at this, our, this Title V language, this ACCJC language, and make it match. Um, among other updates that need, but you know, this is clearly an area that needs updating. So we have been working towards that and we will continue to work towards that. So um, yes, I totally agree. Nobody, nobody in this group, I think, and at CVC disagrees. There needs to be an update. We need to make our language match and hopefully we're getting really close. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions that I should address, Manilena? Mm -hmm. Uh, just comments um, about the the guidance on RSI. So I think, um, yeah. Okay. No, there's no questions. There's an active conversation going on, which is really great. Okay, good. I'm glad. All right. So that's my what I have for these three uh, topics. Now I think I'm going to turn it over to Maria Elena. Let me make sure. Yes, I am. I'm going to turn it over to Maria Elena. She's going to go ahead and talk about um, the course design rubric and the specifically section B. And Marilena, I'll go ahead and open up the chat and kind of keep track of it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so you're gonna have to push the button, yes. Um, the, yes. All right, so the, the areas that we're gonna focus on today are um, B2, uh, three, four, and five. I believe that's what we're, I have to look at my notes, but yes, I believe that's what we're doing today. And um, they are. so uh, basically the, the conversation that's been happening in chat is similar to the conversations that sort of were, are happening all over on local districts everywhere. Um, so B2 is called regular effective contact, which we all know is an older term, but um, and because now it's known as regular and substantive interaction. And specifically B2 is instructor initiated contact. So this is, uh, this is how you are interacting with your students. So one of the things that both the ACCJC rubric and uh, federal regulations and many of our local policies, but also um, the CVC rubric are sort of encouraging here or even thinking about is that regular and substantive interaction requires the early, continuing, and consistent. And those three uh, terms, I think, are very important when we are, you know, when we're thinking about the lens through which we're looking at our, the courses that we're reviewing. Um, and so that has to come um, some sort some of communication from the instructor of record. So, and, and one of the issues that gets brought up is what about automated feedback? What about this and this? But it really is um, the instructor here. So we wanna make sure that that, is, um, that that comes out very clearly. 
So the what of this is that when we're reviewers, we are looking for uh, regular instructor initiated contact. Um, we're using any of the CMS communication tools and that there's also a very clear explanation to the students in the class of when and how that communication is going to happen. The, the where when we're reviewing is that we're, you know, there's multiple places. That instructors are very creative human beings and that's that's the beauty of this. So, but we should be looking at some very obvious places. One is the course syllabus. Another is an or the orientation module, that welcome letter, first day announcements, all of which would be in a master shell when you're reviewing. Uh, a home page, if that's what they're choosing to use. Um, but really, the key here is that the, the explanation and the information that we're giving to our students should be clearly visible and identifiable. In other words, we should be able to, to point, oh, here it is, and here it is over here, and here it is there. So we're looking at the what, the where, and the how. So in terms of how, how this is being done, every instructor and every course is very unique. So we'll look at um, these U, um, sorry, we'll look at these CMS tools like the syllabus tool, um, if it's being used. Um, we're gonna be looking at home pages, how, they're, how those are functioning within the class. We're looking at announcements, grade book. Um, how is the, I mean, we don't, we won't have access to graded assignments, but we, we know that the grade book is a tool. And if it's in the syllabus, that that's a form of feedback, um, then that's even more um, helpful. Um, uh, we're looking at discussions, how often they occur, what type of discussions they are. We're also looking at any synchronous tools that might be enabled in the class. And that could be anything from Zoom, Fonto, chat, or any other of the local campus approved tools. <clears throat> so synchronously, we're looking for those um, those tools, but we're also looking for those asynchronous instructor facilitated um, Q&A discussions. So really just sort of being open to the multiple ways that instructors can, can communicate with their students, but also making sure that those ways are clearly explained to the students. Um, that's, that's key. Okay, and um, if there are any questions um, about that, um, okay, perfect. Let's move to the next Good one. Question. All right. Um, oh. Um, sorry, these are some more key takeaways. I was thinking about as I was talking about this, I'm like, that's a lot to say, but what is the key takeaway here? Sorry about that. Um, and um, the key takeaway here is that uh, and when you're sharing uh, feedback with your instructors um, and, and maybe they're not aligned in this section or maybe they could be, um, ex they could move to exemplary. What are some of those things that you could be sharing with them? Um, it, it's really the early and the often and the how and the when. So if, 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 you, if you share with your instructors a, this this has to be explicit um, in some way. Um, it could be anywhere, but it should be explicit. Um, that's that's key. That's a key takeaway. Another key takeaway is that there should be multiple ways for the students to contact you, um, and that you can contact them synchronous and asynchronous. So make sure you're you're sharing that with instructors. Um, formal and informal interactions encourage students to connect with you and with each other. Uh, through the course, be you know through any of the tools, you know include those in assignments um, where they are most useful. I mean that's one of the one of the exemplary um, uh, qual qualities or characteristics is that you don't just do this, but you do it where they where it might be needed the most, right? So you, the instructor could be doing fabulous work, but it would be cool if they did it in this place too. So sharing that with them is um, just another way to help them. Um, make their course uh, even more fabulous than it already is. So the um, and then um, to remember the key, another key takeaway here is that, and this gets asked a lot, is you know in terms of RSI, is as a, as a regularly scheduled virtual office hour, does that count for RSI? And yes, it does. So that's the fabulous news. Um, and I know we always hear instructors say this, and I've had the same experience where you have a virtual office hour, you know, heck, nobody shows up, you know, or I'm there, but nobody comes, you know, so, but the fact that you have it consistently scheduled is important. And that's what any of the like ACCJC, those, these, these external reviewers are going to be looking for. They're going to be looking for the, the consistency, the, the structured consistency of that. So just know that, um, you can change them around. You can offer other office hours, scheduled office hours, unscheduled office hours. But if you have regular one, that's 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 a good sign. Okay, uh, next slide. Move my thing over. So this is the student initiated. So one is how the how the instructor is going to communicate with 
out to and, and stay connected to their their students. And this is how is a student going to come connect with you? So this is, um, you know, this can happen in a lot of ways, but the most, the when you're reviewing the course, what we're looking for is um, a clear statement of, I, I want you to communicate with me. And these are the multiple ways in which you can do it. And when you do contact me, the this is how um, long you can expect me to get back to you. Hopefully it's within 24 hours, but you know, it can be up to 48. And a lot of times this can be um, contractual, like it could be in your CBA. So whatever it is, um, and every instructor will have something unique, but it should be very explicitly stated. And so we're looking as reviewers in places like the homepage, if that's being used. We're looking at the syllabus document as well as a syllabus tool. Um, we're looking at a welcome letter. Um, if you have a web-based syllabus, um, a, a Google site syllabus, um, maybe it's there too. Uh, if you have in your orientation module, a communication plan um, that explicitly states, this is how you can contact me. Um, if, if you have an orientation module that's approved by your campus and that everybody has to use, that, op that actually helps your instructors and alleviates um, many of the issues in, um, or many of the areas in section B, I, I have found that in, at least on our campus. Um, and the, as a reviewer, um, if, if you can't find how to contact the instructor, um, the students who are in the class probably can't do it either. So the, the feedback to give to the instructor is, you know, or put it everywhere. Everywhere you think, you think you're being redundant, it's okay. It's okay to be redundant. Um, all right, so, and then the how um, is that we're looking for um, these, anything, synchronous tools. Can the students um, talk to you via Pronto, Zoom, any other campus approved tool? Um, are you encouraging the inbox, the, the campus email? Are you, um, did you let them know that they can contact you in the speed grader? Like, hey, there's assignment comment area, you need to got a question. Uh, any kind of Q&A discussion, as long as it, the Q&A discussion is monitored by you, um, because if it's just a Q&A session, a Q&A question that's that you don't even touch ever, you put it out there, but you never go there, um, then that's not really a helpful place for the students to ask you questions. So unless you're planning on, um, unless the instructor explicitly states, I will be in this once a week or once a day to answer a question that comes up, then that's then that that would to me I, as a reviewer I'd go okay that that makes sense, um, but if it was just a random Q and A question with no instructor presence and and no statement that says I'm going to be there then I would probably give that feedback as a reviewer. All right, uh, any questions on that one? Okay, next slide. Before. Sorry, I had, a, I had a question about that. Um, for sure. the Q and A part. Um, to clarify, are you saying that the instructors should specify how long it'll take them to respond when it's a Q&A discussion board? I think uh, what the spirit of that is, and, and, and is that, are you going to monitor that? It, that's really what I'm, what we're looking, what I'm looking for as a reviewer in, in my, um, at my campus. I say, okay, here's a Q&A discussion is in the instructions. Does it say I will be here uh, once a day? to check it out or does it not say anything about how you'll participate in that discussion? Um, so that's really what I'm looking for. The expected response time um, is, is, I feel if you say that you'll answer a question or an instructor says, I'll, be, I'll do it within 24 hours, I'm assuming that they will do that everywhere. But maybe that's an assumption I should not make, but it might be helpful if the instructor added a response time. Like, hey, I don't always come here, but anyone can answer the question. Um, so if you have a more urgent question, use this form, you know, it could be right there in the instructions. So those are the little ways that, um, that as instructors, we can, we can sort of push, not push, but, um, gently nudge our students towards, Hey, this is one form that might feel safe, but here's another form of communication that's faster and that you can get to me and I can get to you back to you faster also. So having it available to them is good because other students can hop in, but, if, if it's not something that the instructor plans to monitor all the time, then I would put a statement in the instructions that says, here's a better way to contact me, a faster way if you have an urgent question that needs answering, right? Um, Raquel, did I answer that question? You did, thank you so much. Okay. I, I do have another question, Madalena. Um, yeah. it's, can't the Q&A be student to student interaction moderated but not intrusive? Sure. Sure, absolutely. As long, and, and I would say that's that's perfect because that would be you know interaction among students in in that sense. If there's no other way for a student to ask you a question, 
then then I would give that feedback. I'd say, you know, students are only they only have this option um, because you've never told them anywhere else or you've never said anywhere else or there's no other place for them to ask you that other than maybe the Canvas inbox. So I, as a reviewer, I'm looking for the the totality of of what is going on. You know, if there's only one Q and A, nobody's there. It's like a it's like a cricket box, like the crickets over there. But if if I have multiple other ways that students can contact me, and I've let them know and I encourage them all the time, then that's as a reviewer, I'm going, okay, yeah, as a student, I feel like I'm welcome here. I, like I could ask a question, they will get answered. Um, not that it's going into the cricket box um, of the Q&A discussion where nobody goes. So I think it's just as a reviewer, you're kind of going to get, you're going to have to feel it out and get a sense by looking at various documents and various things. Um, so it's not, a, unfortunately, we can't just check the box. We can on certain things, but on, on that issue, I would say look widely and um, look in multiple places to see what's going on. There is another question, Marilena, that I wanted to um, kind of talk about out loud. Sure. Um, the, uh, what about requiring interaction, say a mandatory Zoom meeting at the start of the semester to ensure your students aren't bots? And most people are answering um, with this answer and it's correct. We can't require mandatory Zoom meetings in a fully asynchronous class. And that's, that's across correct. the board because then it changes the modality. So we would have to create another modality. And that's a conversation we've had at my campus a lot. And I've tried to like tell people like, no, we can't do this. And they've asked me like, well, where does it say, you know, that we can't do this. So I've had to kind of like, you know, explain that to a faculty. And of course the conversation is about bots, all these bots that are out there. Like, how do we, you know, if we just had that Zoom meeting, we could like be like, okay, that's an actual student in my class. Unfortunately, we can't do that. We have to find other creative ways. Maybe that can be another conversation, probably not in a norming session, but another conversation that CBC can maybe um, provide. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important. And I see a hand. Um, hey, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to add, um, thanks for this, by the way. This is a really helpful <laughs> refresher and taking a lot of notes to share back with our poker cohorts. Um, but I wanted to just share another strategy that we've used at Contra Costa College where um, sometimes we're finding in, you know, in the sandbox, the not real course that we're remediating and then putting up for, you know, badging. Um, it doesn't have students in it. So the interact, there is no, there are no students to interact with. <laughs> um, and so sometimes these examples of this, this, I would always call area B the heart of the heart of our classes. Um, and so the heart of what we do is um, artificial and it, it's hard for faculty to kind of fake it. So I encourage them to go into their live classes and take actual announcements that they have in their live classes and videos um, and put them in an unpublished area of the course or even actually in the announcement section is ideal for this case. But as an example of here are some other things that I typically do, a kind of example of how I have this interaction throughout the course so that it is showing that they do, you know, whatever it is, weekly announcements or they're using Pronto, for example, we use Pronto. And so they've got a snap of that or if they have another embedded um, program I'm forgetting the acronym for it L LTI what is it called when there's like another an external tool inside of our courses if they're LTI. using something LTI. Uh, thank you <laughs> LCI thank you so if they're using something like that to show a video of how they're using it and where those interactions are um, so it's also demonstrating to the reviewers that they really are meeting not just meeting this just to check the box but they really do have the heart of the student interaction and the rsi in place um, so that especially with a reviewer being outside of their area of discipline really can see this so just food for thought another strategy to help support our folks towards their badging thanks and then i just like to make another comment on the zoom you know meetings and things like that so we can offer optional zoom meetings in an asynchronous class, but they have to be completely optional. And also, um, I believe they have to provide information. They can't provide new information on those Zoom meetings. Yeah. Like they, it, it can be a sort of support. Um, somebody talked about like the English faculty uh, have writing clinics that are on Zoom that are optional. Something like that would be great, but it has to be optional and you cannot provide new information that the students that are not attending are not going to get at all. So like sort of review sessions are good, you know, things like you can do clarifying uh, sessions, things like that, but they all have to be optional and that's, that's the key. Mm -hmm. right, I think we can go on. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, Everyone know, know other questions about this hot topic? I'm so excited about these conversations. Okay, I think we're good on the chat though. Yeah, I just wanted to make yes. sure. Yes, okay, good, okay. okay. Cool, all right, we're gonna go Next on one. Last to one. four. E four. So this is our student initiated contact with other students. And um, this is an interesting one that comes up a lot. Um, and that is, um, this is for unstructured um, student initiated interaction with other students. And so we're providing opportunities or they're, they're building, the course design provides opportunities for students to interact with each other um, at, um, in ways that um, sort of mimic that, that informal before class, in class, after class kind of, hey, let's connect, let's do the various things. So this is um, another of those areas where it's it's important for as a reviewer to be able to um, to point to places where I can see that this is either explained um, with instructions on how to access the, the whatever tool you're using or um, or um, just explicitly explaining that this is this is here, this is yours, this is whatever, and I'm not gonna be a part of this or I will be a part of this. Um, but the, the reason why we want these unstructured um, interactions in before um, here is that um, every, I think most, most everybody here in this particular call is familiar with the DE research that pretty much hands down says that the, the single most um, important predictor of, our, of the success of our students in, in classes is how they feel in the class, right? It's 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 their sense of belonging, it's their sense of community, um, and how and how they're seen or heard in this asynchronous environment. So, the the purpose for this, even though it is not um, it's not a federal requirement, it is not in you know it's not anywhere except. Perhaps maybe you're in your own local AP. Um, our local AP does have um, that it is interaction among students where applicable, right? So there are, we've allowed um, instructors to make that choice. Like it's applicable, you know, we encourage it. But if you'd have a, a discipline that maybe can't do it for for reasons or for whatever reasons, then you are not required to have that. We won't be looking for that. Um, so there's there's a lot of nuances in this one. But um, for the most part, the reason is community and connection. That's that's pretty much why, and that's why we do this whole section anyway, is how do we connect with our students? Um, so when we're reviewing a course, we're going to look for um, places that that are obvious, you know, like the student lounge and the class Q&A forum. You know, we mentioned that in the previous one, but this one might be one that is not monitored by you. It is a student led one. So it could just be, hey, I'm not going to be here. Students are going to be here. You guys answer your own questions. But if you have an urgent one, contact me. So I would still encourage those instructions somehow. But um, student lounge, class Q&A, um, some Instructors might um, ha encourage or link a class blog. There might be, um, you might notice that there's a, some wiki pages that uh, are in there for students to kind of work into among each other, to, with each other. There might be ungraded discussions like, hey, what's going on today? Share this, share that, or connect with each other. Um, it could be in each module. It could be in a, the separate discussion area. So again, as the reviewer, you're going to open that 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 vision and really sort of look at the course holistically um, as well as do those deep dives into the modules and see where, where these things are occurring. Um, you might notice in the syllabus document that, or, or even in an assignment that, that they're encouraging um, voluntary study groups. You might see that in, you know, maybe um, pre-exam um, week, it might be um, encouraged there. So um, you might see the chat feature enabled in the course navigation as if with instructions on how to use it or when it could be most useful. Um, you might see Pronto, you might see another communication tool, um, as, and you might be looking at the orientation module. You might be looking multiple places to see where the information is about this, how can students do it, and where and how often you, you see the instructor encouraging that um, or, or building that into the design of the course. Um, you can see that in synchronous tools like um, Zoom, Pronto, Chad, I think I mentioned, um, any other campus approved tool that, that you your campus has, uh, Canvas Inbox, um, Chat, Student Lounge, content-based discussions. Um, it could be um, uh, 
Yeah. So just these informal, unstructured um, conversations that the students can have um, with each other. So that's B4. And then the last one is um, B5. And this is also another one that isn't necessarily uh, mandated by law, um, but it is it is a practice that, again, uh, as in an asynchronous environment, we know that we're all trying to increase our student, our success outcomes, our equity, reduce our equity gaps. And the way we do that is through engaging our students and, and humanizing our course and making our, our, um, our, our content and our, our presence in the class visible and engaging. So I think that's the, the kind of all the things that we're trying to do as instructors and we're trying to encourage in the courses that we are reviewing. So um, B5 is a little bit different because it's more about the structured and the formal ones. So we're looking in different areas for this. So whereas, you know, the un unstructured one could be, you know, students just chatting in pronto going, hey, would you, and I had a great time. This was a good lecture, right? <laughs> um, and then um, B5 is more about, okay, this is, I want you to do this project or I want you to do something else. So this is course content or unit objectives. So it could be larger course outcomes also, it could be a scaffolded project, it could be multiple things that you're looking at as a reviewer. So you're going to look in those whole um, uh, course discussions and you, the course discussion could be set up in the whole course, but also pay attention to see if the instructor has initiated small group discussion um, or if they've created groups in Canvas. Um, and they won't do that in the master course, but you'll be able to see that this is set as a small group discussion. Um, so you'll be able to look and see um, the nature of the discussion. You might also know, see, okay, oh yeah, there's a peer review here. And the peer review can be set up in multiple ways also using the peer review tool or using a discussion or using an assignment. So there's lots of ways to see how that's being done. Um, it could be a critique. Um, maybe there's a, um, a critique discussion session where people post their art and they um, in a small group and then everyone gives feedback on it the way you would do in a studio class. Um, it could be critique, it could be or public speaking, you know, I so uh, you could have group projects, you could have labs, um, lab groups, you could have um, many, many ways here, um, thinking through all the possibilities, but be sure to also review the assignment instructions. So if you're looking at something and you're not sure, make sure the instructions are explicit and, and they mention that this is a, an assignment that requires you to collaborate and here's how it looks and this is what you're gonna do and this is how you access your group project. So um, if it's not immediately obvious to you, um, then make sure you look for those collaboration instructions because if it's not immediately obvious, it's not immediately obvious to you, um, probably not to your to the a student either. They're going to have a lot of questions about it. So, um, and how how this can occur? This can occur again in all the usual kind of ways: the synchronous tools like Zoom, Pronto, or any other campus approved um, tool. Um, you can do asynchronous content based discussions, the small group whole class inbox, cloud based collaborations, wiki pages. You can use Canvas groups. Um, if you create Canvas groups. Um, prior to your class, um, it, they automatically get created in Pronto. So if you set up your lab groups, um, it'll already pull over. So there's a lot and other tools that will do the same thing. So just um, again, as a reviewer, you're, you're keeping your vision open. You're keeping your, your, your gaze wide so that you are able to look holistically at the course and get a sense for the feel of, of, of how this instructor is um, designing this course to encourage that interaction, that connection, that community, um, and being very explicit about how that's occurring. So um, any questions on that one? Sorry, Marilena, um, I'm looking. The, the, no questions on that one. I think some people are like um, sharing ideas, Go but ahead. there is like some conversation on before um, and how it's so hard to get students to like participate in these like chat groups and we just put them out there. And the people that seem to have success is the instructor kind of initiates like, you know, like, oh, let's let's post this. But, uh -huh. you know, which is great. But I understand the goal of this. The goal is to have a space for students to talk to each other without mm -hmm. the instructor, you know, presence. Right. The idea well, is great. But I do know that this is difficult because I've had many semesters with like, you know, this kind of discussion. Um for them but um 
real, not a lot of action. Uh, but somebody did mention like the, this before, it, it also is important for us to really emphasize the importance of it and remind students because if we're only telling them the first week of the semester, th there's too much information the first week of the semester. But anyway, yeah. um, that, that's true. kind of the discussion. I, I agree that, that you know, having that, having, so, so you know, we can, a, a, an instructor can meet alignment, you know, they can be aligned, but there's also that extra bit. So if we want to encourage um excellence in our courses or if we want to nudge our instructors towards maybe upping that that interaction uh, game then then encouraging them to do it often in the class maybe at the bottom of an assignment say hey let's chat with each other or don't forget you can talk to each other here or got questions you know what i mean so there's a lot of different ways that where we can put it but if you're always putting it out there and if it's an expectation from day one that it's going to be a very um, active class um, we know that that's true. And I mean, I've taught in the classroom, I've taught here, I mean, I've taught online, and I know that, you know, the person sitting in the back of my class, um, not saying anything, um, is still there listening, right? They're still there. They're still present in my course. So um, even if I'm trying my hardest to get them engaged, but they won't, um, that's, it, 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 they're still there. And so that's the same in an online class. We're going to get students who are engaging, who are there, uh, but they're there. Right, they're there, and we just have to make those assumptions that they're there. And so, um, aside from um, not being there, which we would also know in a in a face to face class, they just aren't there. <laughs> they're not in the seat. Um, All right. Speaking of group activities, I'm going to go on because um, my we're we're past time, but that's okay. We'll be yeah. fine. All right. I do have a small group discussion for you guys. So I am going to put you in groups and it's going to be like really short because we don't have a lot of time, probably eight minutes in your in your small groups. I'll, I'll form the groups right now. But these are the questions. This is what your, your group is going to talk about. And Marielena, can you drop the I, I created a Google Doc. I hope everyone can see it. I think I said the permissions right um, so that you can have this question with you. Um, so the you're going to talk about the what is the most important? What is the most common issues you see in Section B? as a reviewer and how are these resolved? And then just other questions. Is the problem with section B instructors not understanding? Is it confusion from the review team? Another issue, what activities has your poker team identified to alleviate the issue? So just conversation about section B, um, how do, rem like, like what problems do we see more often? How do you remediate those problems, you know, as a, as a reviewer? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open up some breakout rooms. Let me see, there's a hundred and how many of us, 32? I'll do like, okay, I'm gonna do like 13. I'll do 13 and it's gonna be big groups. Well, actually, no, let me make more, 15. Okay, Um. so I'm gonna go ahead and create them like eight minutes and then I'm gonna bring you back. Okay, so go ahead and open that link that Marilena just dropped. I'll try to drop it again for everyone. Uh, so you have that. And we'll be back in about eight minutes. Okay. Hello. I think, I think this might be our group. Is this our group? Um, Sochi, are you in this group also? I didn't put a, us in a group. Okay. So these are people yeah. who have been unassigned. Yeah. Um, um, everyone seems to be assigned. Oh, there's not. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody's assigned a group. I don't have. Oh, wait, I have just you and oh, I do have one person there. I assigned them to a group, but just you okay. and I don't have a group. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, you should have been, everybody should be assigned a group. Come on, Elena, when we come back, let's drop the Google link. I'm sorry, the yep. link for the survey. But you know what? I updated the survey right now. I wonder if the link changed. Oh. Let me see. I'll I'll give I'll send it to you right now. I'll give it to you. Okay. You want to put it on the form or you send it to me? Yeah, I'll I'll put it on the form. Okay. And this is group discussion, this one. Um well, I guess it does change. Let me put it on the bottom too. Well, that's good to know. Wow. <laughs> but it changes. So um, when we are in breakout rooms, do, do you pause the recording? Oh, no, I didn't. I should have. I'll pause it now, but we have like three minutes left. <laughs> okay.
All right. I think everyone is coming back because I, the breakout rooms are now officially closed. Thank you so much for um, hitting the join breakout room button. Hopefully you had a little bit of time to have a discussion with your group. We have very little time left for this first hour of the session. So I am just going to ask, would anybody like to share some of the insights, uh, topics that you guys were talking about in your group? Just go ahead and mute yourself or raise your hand. Either one works. Anyone? Want we to talked share? about the communication page and how essential it is to actually share with our students what they can expect in our course in terms of all, all of the different interactions that happen. Yeah, that's that's really good. That's a great point. And you know what I think also, like I think I mentioned this a little while ago, we give them so much information in week one, which is good. We have to. But then do they really remember that information? So like pointing out things like the communication page, like, hey, don't forget, like week three, don't forget. Like this is our communication policy. Like you can reach out to me, you can reach out to students. That's a great, that, that's really good. Uh, anyone else want to share? So, Chi, so we discussed um, that we were in general agreement that instructor to student interaction should definitely happen weekly, but we were not on the same page re regarding student to student interactions. So I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Sure. And so you're talking about Adele, like the frequency of the student to student interaction? Yes, exactly. And was that like, like... I don't want to say formal, but like in, instructor initiated student, student, student interaction or like just student, student interaction, like they're free to interact on their own. The student, the, the necessity for instructors to set up, uh, discussion, small groups, structured, like that. yes, structured student to student interactions every single week. My personal feeling is no, not every single week. Um, so my expectations are different instructor to student versus student to student. Uh, but uh, I know at least one person in our group would love some clarification that it does not have to be every single week, like during finals week, you better get in a discussion group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that's a great question. Um, but... Mandy raised her hand. Um, okay. I don't know if it's related or if it's... Oh, go ahead, Mandy. Yeah, it's related. So uh, we were having a, a similar discussion about like those structured um, discussions, like how often should they be um, in particular classes? Like, and we had, you know, if it's an eight week class, maybe or a five week class, maybe three discussion forums is not horrible. Right. But in a 16 week class, maybe that's not or like not discussion forums only, maybe um, uh, opportunities for students to interact with one another in a structured manner, right? Like whether it's group work or projects or discussion forums or whatever. Um, but, you know, and it also depends on how, uh, what discipline it is, right? Mm -hmm. So like an English class is gonna have a lot more discussion forums and, and things like that, and, uh, but maybe a math class will have fewer. Maybe a math class will also have like different ways of, um, of, interact, of having students interact with one another. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mandy. So I think it, I think it's really hard to like put like a number on every class like the same, like everyone needs to have a weekly discussion. Right. I think what Mandy mentioned, like like the subject area is really important, like just the way the course is structured is important. I think what's important and as reviewers, because, you know, we're looking we're we're I think we're always thinking about our course if we teach, but we're thinking of courses when we review them, right? Um, I really think it's important that there are opportunities for this, you know, instructor-led interaction, right? Um, like if it's happening one time, that's probably not enough. You know, there has to be like several opportunities throughout the semester. And again, it depends on the subject area, you know, I come from English and Maria Elena does as well. And that's like, you know, it's easy to have discussions because if you're, you know, if you guys still read novels in your class or, you know, essays, things like that. But in a course like, you know, those CTE courses, that may be a little bit 
harder to implement, um, but there still should be a sense of there's like these discussions occurring. There's these opportunities for students to discuss among themselves based on the content. Um, I know I didn't answer the question, like I'm not gonna give a number because I don't <laughs> think it's fair to give a number. I really right. feel like it's, it's based on the makeup of the class, um, you know, it's based on the subject area. And I think as a review team, and this is the most important, this is where, where it's really important for your review team to come together and have these conversations mm -hmm. in your campus, you know, and and this is again, one when you're reviewing a course, why it's so good to have another reviewer, like two sets of eyes looking at that course, because then you can talk to each other, like, you know what, I thought there wasn't enough student to student interaction, like, you know, there's one group project that occurs in week five and that's it. And then there could be a conversation with that other reviewer. And then the poker leads, I think, also play a really big part in that. Mm -hmm. um, and I do get questions like every so often about total, like different topics. So you can always feel free to reach out to me or Maria Elena and be like, this is happening in the course. Like we really don't know. Our review team is, is kind of stuck. We don't know what to do. And we can at least help guide you you know, towards an answer. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat. Yeah. Else, Mani Lena, that I should. It's a lot of it's mostly around um, B4 and B5 and, and the nature, kind of the same conversation we're having right now. Yeah. What's interesting to me is that there's a difference, I think, between um, aligned, like, you know, if someone's, some, you can have like the minimal requirement and if it meets the requirement and your norming and your poker group and your team, agrees that it meets, then it meets. But that doesn't mean there's room for uh, moving into exemplary or moving into a different uh, place. Even the ACCJC rubric, if you look at it, it has four, you know, it's got initial and then it's got highly developed, right? So it, it encourages um, movement along a continuum. So I think in that spirit, aligned means, yes, you meet, you, you meet the minimum that's okay. But if you want to continue to improve or to make excellent, then here are some ideas and suggestions that you could, you could do um, that you, that would help th with that. I think that, um, you know, like as such, he says, it, get, for us to say this number is not, this is the number, there is no number. That's really a review team and a campus uh, cultural um, element that you might want to um, sit down and have those conversations. It's good. They're good conversations. They are. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop because we are like past time according to my schedule, um, which is fine because this is great conversation. I'm gonna ask Maria Elena, can you drop the survey? So we're gonna drop a survey in because I know some of you may have to leave after the first hour because the way it's we set up these norming sessions, it's the first hour it's norming, the second hour is more like poker lead kind of stuff. You're welcome to stay around for the two hours, but if you do have to leave, Please um, don't leave before filling out that survey for us. We really appreciate the feedback. I hope you can open it. I think I said everything appropriate. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that <laughs> thumbs up. Um, okay. So I was supposed to give you a 10-minute break because um, in, in the survey, some a few people said, like, can we take a break because it's a really long session? I'm going to give you a five-minute break because... <laughs> We don't have time for a 10 minute break. So uh, if you guys want to hang out, I'm going to stay here. I, you know, I can't go very far in five minutes, but if you can, or if you just want to like, you know, relax your mind for five minutes, I'm going to turn on my phone timer and then we will come back and we're going to have some um, college spotlights that are going to share out their, their, the cool stuff they're doing at their college. So I'll give you five minutes. All right, so up next we have, oh wait, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself in my slides. Oh, here we go. We have um, our first spotlight. It's gonna be Christy Fertha and Nancy Olson. I hope they're here and they're back. I just made you guys yep. co-host. Awesome. I, I just am made back. You guys co um, they are from Barstow College and they are gonna be presenting some of their poker stuff with us. So. Uh, Christy and Nancy, go ahead. You have you can share your screen. You're a co-host, so I'll be I'll be manning the chat. Me and Marilena. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Um, I can share Nancy if that works for you. 
maybe Nancy. Sure, not. that works okay, for good. me. <laughs> oh, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just get a little uh, jump in the gun there. Uh, all right. So let me see if this works. Can you guys see it? We do. Yes. All right. Good. And there we go. Okay, so I am Christy Firtha, and uh, my colleague Nancy Olson is here. We are both on the distance education uh, and instructional technology committee together. I am the faculty coordinator. I teach English and ethnic studies as well. Uh, and Nancy is the director of distance education and instructional technology. Did you want to introduce yourself more, Nancy, or is that good? Oh, that's fine with me. All right. <laughs> Uh, so we are going to talk a little bit about RSI on our campus. It's something that we've been working really hard on. Uh, something that I also want to preface about our campus is that, you know, Barstow is a small campus. It's a rural campus. Uh, and so some of the, the issues that I know larger colleges face, we don't uh, face quite as much. So like student to student contact, there's a lot of students who already know each other because they have multiple classes together because we are a rural and small campus. Um, and we also, since we are a rural cam uh, campus and we serve uh, like places like Fort Irwin, uh, even before COVID, more than 50% of our classes were online. So we've had a, a robust DE program for uh, for many years now. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nancy has been kind of at the, the forefront of that uh, as well. Uh, so we've got this little graphic here for you. Uh, we came across uh, about the kind of differences between correspondence education and distance education, which I think hopefully will become more clear, uh, but it's largely uh, uh, dependent, I guess you could say, on RSI uh, and the actual student uh, and instructor involvement and interaction together. So uh, I am not advancing. Why is that not working? Okay, um, there we go. Okay. Uh, so over, well, since probably about 2017, we've been focusing on, uh, first it was, right. what was it, regular, it wasn't RSI, it was substantial. Regular, regular, regular and contact. effective contact. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> All these acronyms. Uh, and now, of course, we've got the uh, regular and substantive interaction. Uh, and so we've uh, kind of updated our policies and they focus on um, instructor inter uh, initiated interaction. So we, our policy states that instructors will regularly initiate interaction with students on a group or one-to-one -one basis that uh, will somewhere explain the frequency and duration of the contact and that it should be comparable to that of uh, a face-to-face -face class. Um, so like the lecture material should be there, the uh, accessibility to the students uh, and establishing interaction expectations. So the instructor or department uh, establishes a policy describing the frequency and timelines of instructor initiated contact and instructor feedback will be posted in the syllabus or other course documents that are made available for students when the course officially opens each semester. So. These are things like, you know, in our attendance requirements, we make sure to specify what it means to be attending for students uh, to have their attendance counted for a online course, a fully online asynchronous course. Uh, we post like, you know, how long uh, your the feedback can be expected to be uh, to take and that sort of thing. And we actually have boilerplate for that. Uh, so this is the boilerplate. So we plate. So we mandate for our uh, instructors in the policy uh, what counts as regular and substantive interaction. Uh, and so for uh, the instructor to student uh, contact and interaction between students, uh, we make sure that our instructors have a weekly threaded discussion forum, uh, either through Canvas or through Hypothesis or you know uh, some other uh, software that encourages the student to instructor and student to student interaction. The instructor is required to be present and interact with the students uh, in the discussion board in a manner that facilitates uh, and encourages further class discussion. Uh, we encourage our instructors to chunk material, uh, to respond directly to student posts, to uh, ask uh, students questions, to develop and guide the discussion. And when we talk about it in our meetings, uh, like our best practices and things like that, uh, we talk about it as if it were a in-person discussion. So if a student says something, uh, you respond. Or if a student has a question, uh, you respond. And you just kind of encourage other students to respond as well. 
Uh, the requirement for instructors is that they must participate in discussions on more than one day uh, in any given week. Uh, so they can choose what days, they can choose what times, but it needs to be more than one day so that uh, students really uh, feel the presence of the instructor in the uh, discussion forums. And we recommend at least three times a week on different days. Uh, for the lessons, uh, this is, you know, instructor, we see this as instructor contacting students, kind of like, you know, a lecture would be in class. Uh, and so we ask that instructors uh, post a lesson for each week and that the lessons be curated uh, by the instructor. So it can't be, you know, lessons that are downloaded from, uh, you know, a publishing house or something like that. It needs to be instructor curated so that uh, the instructors are actually like, you know, you can show a video, but you also have to discuss how does the video like interact with the material that you're presenting and the overall uh, units uh goals and objectives for the week. Um, and so we want to make sure that that's clear. We recommend three to five pages of lesson for each week or the you know equivalent um, of that. Uh, we uh, ask that instructors have online quizzes or exams each week so that instructors can give students some feedback. The um, and of course, this could be different. So like uh, for my English classes, I have uh, paper drafting assignments, right? And those are all kind of build up. So the assignments, uh, the important part is not necessarily what the assignment is, but that instructors are giving students feedback on a weekly basis on their work for the class. Um, and then some other mandatory types of interaction uh, that we specify for people uh, is that uh, we need to make sure that there is timely response to student emails and we define that as within two working days. Uh, and so I know some instructors take the weekends off. So we ask that they specify that as, and that's why we also say working days. Uh, that uh, uh, instructors send out general uh, emails or messaging through the LMS. So if they need to send a message to the whole class or if they wanna send a welcome to the whole class. Uh, and sometimes they can even like duplicate their announcements and send them out in email as well as in the announcements so that students are sure to get them. Uh, for the grading, uh, we define timely student uh, or timely feedback on student work, which is uh, within one working week of the due date. And our, our final grades are actually due uh, two, two days after uh, the semester ends. So that's the only time when that, uh, that uh, grading is cut short. Uh, and I should also mention that these are all union approved. So it went through the whole long process of, you know, uh, faculty, uh, the Senate, the union, the administration and all of that. Uh, we uh, ask that instructors make announcements in weekly announcements in the LMS. So whether those are pre-programmed or not, uh, that you know something appears announcement wise for each student, remembering, uh, reminding them that their class is uh, continuing to go on. Uh, and then office hours, we don't require office hours for part-time faculty, uh, part faculty, but for full-time faculty, uh, we require regular vir uh, virtual office hours if the instructor is teaching online uh, and the it, it, our contract says that it needs to be proportional to the amount uh, of online classes being taught. Um, so if you're teaching, like our course load is generally five. So if one course is online and uh, four are in person, then you would be doing one of your office hours online and the you know, other four uh, in person. Uh, and so the question then, of course, is we have all of these policies, we worked really hard on them, they've made it through like all the different uh, um, uh, uh, bodies of the institution. So like, you know, the faculty, the staff, the administration. So how do we communicate these to our faculty? Uh, so one thing that we came up with, and I'm going to see if this pops up for me now, like it did when I was reviewing this myself. Does that show for you guys? No, we can only see your slide. Okay, okay. So let me see if I can share this real quick. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, our, uh, we came up with a checklist that we give to instructors, especially new instructors uh, when they're just starting. And it kind of, uh, it matches up with the, the CVC rubric. And uh, it kind of details what does this mean for us and how do we expect these things to be uh, accomplished? Um, and so that we've got the types of contact, we've got the when, uh, and, you know, so you can see the pre-course contact initiated prior to or at the beginning of course, um, uh, initiate and maintain contact with students, so through announcements in Canvas, minimally, 
uh, one at minimum weekly. So we've got a whole bunch of like we've outlined specifically all of the things that we talk about uh, in our policies and um, you know how uh, instructors can accomplish those in their classes. So that's one way that we share. And then I have lost the there it is. Okay, the PowerPoint. Uh, we also uh, communicate these through announcements and emails. So the somebody from the distance education committee will send out reminders uh, and announcements uh, about you know what our RSI policies are, uh, where to find the DE policies, and that sort of thing. Uh, we've also done Canvas global announcements, uh, and we actually did one just recently reminding uh, instructors about uh, what RSA requirements are. Uh, we do a lot of in-house training, uh, and Nancy does that in the, the DE department. So we've got a lot of uh, courses set up through there. Uh, and then we try and tie everything together uh, with our evaluations, uh, instructor evaluations. Uh, and again, this is all gone through the union. So it's it's uh, there are parts of it that are part of the contract. So uh, the next, I think this is Nancy, where you uh, continue. Do you want me to be Vanna or do you want to... Um, uh, if if you can just click as we as I finish this slide, that'd be wonderful, Christy. Can do. All right. So I'm here today to talk about professional development. At Barso Community College, we started DE in 1997, and at that time, we realized that our faculty were expert in their fields, but they were not necessarily experts in DE because nobody really had DE, right? So how can you be an expert in it? I've been at the college since that time. I've been their DE expert for um, supporting the faculty and training them. So today I wanna talk to you about teaching online with instructional design, which is our five week mandatory course for all online hybrid and high flex faculty. We have a, a lot of other courses, but this is the core course that gets it all started. It's a six module course. So in week one, they do unit zero, which is locating resources and unit one, which is introduction to Canvas. In unit two, they're gonna do course design and development, creating and organizing materials in Canvas. In unit three, they're gonna manage course communication and interaction with Canvas tools. In unit four, they're going to do assessment in Canvas, quizzes, assignments, and grades. And then in unit five, we're going to give them the BCC policies, remind them about our course design requirements and do like a catch up week. Um, what I do want to mention uh, really quickly is that we also designed our course so that went by the time they're through with this course, they've built their syllabus, their orientation model module, and their first two weeks of work. So it's a practical class, not just a learning class. Now in unit three, we cover managing course communication and interaction with Canvas tools. So we cover discussion options like peer reviews, groups, and liking. We also teach faculty how uh, to write a subjective discussion question and, um, you know, the importance of Peer reviews are very good for furthering student to student interaction, which is one of our requirements. Groups help you know, to focus, you, you get a smaller group and it's a lot easier for those students to focus in and move forward. And liking has its place in that, you know, you can kind of tell where the students are at. And also if everybody's liking a post that's inaccurate, oh, you know, you have issues, right? Conversations, we cover that, we cover the Canvas inbox, we want our faculty to feel very comfortable in the Canvas inbox and in how to use it. And finally, we cover synchronous communication and we cover both Teams and Zoom because we found that our faculty are kind of split. The majority of them love Zoom, some, some like Teams. All right, um, for unit four, we cover assessment in Canvas, the quizzes, the assignments and the grades. Now, as you can see on, on all these RSI, graphics, they're saying quizzes are not part of distance education, but you can change that by, change, by adding question level feedback from the instructor and by going in at the end of the quiz period, going into SpeedGrader and providing feedback on that quiz so that if you see a student 
has done excellent work on, on identifying and correcting comma splices, but they just really don't understand what a fragment is. You can go in there and say, you know, I suggest that you review this part of your class and that elevates your quizzes. Now, the second part of quizzes that is RSI are the student feedback via anonymous surveys because that allows your students to feel free to say, you know what, I was so lost on how to divide a cell. I don't, I still, I, I'm just, I don't know what to do. Um, and they can do that without fear, right? So that's an, another way to have RSI. Now for assignments, there's two different ways to do assignments that will initiate RSI. Those are group assignments and peer review assignments. So if you don't know how to do those, you go into um, Instructure, they have tutorials on how to do those and they both contribute to RSI, even though it's in the assignment area. Now for feedback and quiz and grades, um, SpeedGrader now has the rich text editor embedded in it with the ADA checker. So now you can actually give those comments and they can be very robust and you can check them for ADA compliance. And the audio and video now has automated um, captions, which is not quite ADA compliant, but it's such a giant step forward. I'm gonna take it and count it as a big win. Um, for core statistics, you might say, oh, what's that got to do with online? That's nothing to do with RSI, but it does because you can look at your core statistics and from there you can determine, um, oh, you know what? My students, they're, they're just, so lost when it comes to the different types of government. So I'm going to do another assessment. I'm going to do a group assignment and we're going to work this out together. All right, we're moving on. For the BCC policies, course designs and catching up, outcomes and rubrics, they contribute to RSI because they give you more time to do individualized grading. When you do outcomes and rubrics, you're giving the standards. This is what I want to see in the assignment. And you can quickly go through and click on the boxes and say, yes, this is met. No, this isn't met. And that gives you more time for individualized responses, right? We, we go back over course development. We make sure throughout this whole thing, I have instructional design specialists. They are absolutely fabulous. They are assigned a faculty member. Each faculty member has their own instructional design specialist and they will work with them throughout their tenure at the college to make sure that they're meeting the guidelines. If they need help, they're there. That's one of, I think, our biggest advantages. Um, interaction, Christy did a wonderful job of going over that and our policies. We go over the committees. The two primary ones that we focus on are the curriculum committee because we always want to enhance our OER offerings. And by, by explaining to the faculty how to get an OER adopted in this class, we can always increase it. Adjuncts are wonderful at finding those information. Um, of course, full-timers are too, but you'd be surprised how, what the adjuncts come up with. All right, and then for our distance education and instructional technology committee, Christy and I firmly believe the more faculty we have that are participating in that committee, the more student or faculty voice we have and the better our program is going to be. All right, so we also cover the OEI rubric for um, the section B for instructor contact and student to student contact. And we give our faculty ideas of ways to meet those, those sections of the rubric. So how to do pre-course contact, what is regular effective contact and how do you maintain it? What student initiated contact, not imitated. Oh, I missed that. All right, and then we cover what student initiated contact, what's regular effective contact and what are the participation levels that we have um, push through our, our procedures. All right, last one for me, guys. Okay, so um, our substantive interaction contact policy, it covers initiated interaction, frequency and duration, and establishing expectations and managing unexpected instructor absence so that we're giving that information to our faculty before they ever even teach a class. We go over the mandatory types of contact, the discussion forums, the timely feedback, the weekly announcements, and we make sure they understand that, you know, just going in and posting an announcement that says, these are your due dates for the week. That's not really an announcement. An announcement is clarifying and explaining your contact 
your content and your and you know reminding them I'm here go go to the office hour talk to me and then um, we have virtual office hours they're required for our full-time faculty only but a lot of our adjuncts do it because we tell them you know at the very beginning you can offer office hours without any additional time you do it when you're grading you got to grade anyway right all right I'm going to turn this back over to Christy so she can explain instructor evaluation Should unmute myself there. <laughs> I just noticed some messages popped up in the chat. So sorry, I need to get back to the uh, the thing here without clicking for it. There we go. Okay. Uh, so we do on campus, we try to uh, bring everything full circle uh, because, I mean, we, like I said, we've been doing this for a while and it's been through all of the different uh, uh, parties of interest on campus. Uh, so the place where this ends up, uh, I guess, coming up again is for instructor evaluations. Uh, and these, of course, are negotiated through contract uh, and they do take uh, into consideration all of the DE policies and things that we come up with. So when we're asked to, as faculty, uh, observe a course of another faculty member, uh, there are certain things that we check for. So we check for the instructor uh, contact within the discussions and make sure that they engage with students on at least two different days per week and that they provide substantive and effective uh, comments. Uh, so it has to be, of course, more than just the great job moving on, great job moving on. Uh, and that will, of course, depend on the course that the instructor is teaching, uh, but there needs to be some sort of feedback. So like if a student had a question for you in class or said something in class that you're like, well, that's really good, actually, or, oh, that's kind of off, you misunderstood this sort of concept. Those need to be mentioned in the discussion, and that's uh, what we look for. Uh, we, for instructor uh, evaluations, also make sure that uh, it uh, the course adheres to the course design rubric and other DE concepts as much as possible, uh, that uh, there are virtual office hours uh, each week where students can access uh, their instructors, again, for full-time faculty. It's a, a bonus for part-time faculty, but it's not a requirement. Uh, we look to make sure that they're providing weekly informational announcements to students so that it's not just like, uh, be sure to submit your discussion for the day. You, know, you want to have a little bit more information there. Uh, we also have a couple sections on making sure that course materials are ADA compliant. Uh, so um, a lot of times, well, sometimes publisher materials are, sometimes they're not. And again, that shouldn't be the bulk of it. Uh, but we also want to make sure that if uh, an instructor is embedding a video in the course, that the video is more than just audio uh, auto generated captions uh, and that it it's, uh, you know, it is embedded in a way that is where students are clear about what to do with it. So you don't just like stick a link to a video. Uh, you say, okay, so this, uh, please watch this video uh, and think about how it ties in with, you know, this concept, that concept, the other concept that we're doing for the week. And then uh, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes these will be followed up with, uh, you know, something related to the discussion. So we wanna just make sure that things are well inter integrated uh, and ADA compliant. Uh, and again, that ties in with uh, making sure that the instructor prepared materials are substantial. And this, like I said, is not to say that like I show videos in class, right? Uh, I think everybody who, who teaches in the humanities uh, shows videos in class at some point, uh, but it's never just like you start the video, leave the classroom and come back when it's over, right? You talk about it, you integrate it. So uh, that's what uh, we tell instructors, that's what, uh, you should be doing, and that's what we look for uh, also in the evaluations, that these materials are uh, substantial and that they are integrated uh, well into the class. So uh, so that's our RSI process at uh, Barstow College, and uh, and I think it's pretty well integrated. We, we uh, I mean, of course, uh, are always trying to improve, but, uh, but that's all that we've got for you guys for now. So uh, farewell. Thank you guys for having us. And uh, if you have any, I don't know if we have time for questions, but we're happy to answer questions if there's time. Christy, thank you so much. And Christy and Nancy, thank you both so much. This is has been very helpful. A lot of us here in this meeting are very jealous of this process, but it, hopefully it will inspire a, a lot of us to, you know, get to all of these great things that you have sh shared. Um, 
I'm not gonna um, ask for people to ask questions, but please drop them in the chat. I know uh, Nancy and both Christy have been answering in the chat because we have to go on to our next presenter. Um, but once again, uh, thank you both so much for taking the time to put this together and for um, presenting this to us because this is something that we all need. And I saw a few questions about like, you know, academic Senate and uh, union things. So, um, you know, we're all kind of in the same boat, but all we can do is try and, you know, put these things also in our college. So once again, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go thank ahead and introduce us. our next presenter. Um, that this is it's, uh, Sarah Bolin from Contra Costa College. And she's going to be talking about um, Contra Costa's um, poker process. So Sarah, go yeah. ahead. I am ready. I just want to make sure. I, oh, I do have screen share. Thank yes. you so much. Um, so my name is Sarah Boland, I'm the poker lead from Contra Costa College. And you'd think after all this time, I would be locked into screen share. So thanks for your patience while I do this. Thank you so much. I always try to keep humor um, in my role as poker lead, especially, but I'm also a counselor. So um, I try to keep it light. And I also find that, um, you know, that helps also bring down some of the anxiety of the poker process for folks when we're going through this. I'm learning uh, a lot of things as we go along too. And I always learn a lot from our sessions when we're all together at this, these norming sessions. So I wanna say thanks again for continuing all the work to everybody. Um, so again, Sarah Boland, CCC, uh, poker lead and counselor. I've been doing this since um, fall 2020. So that was a fun time to start poker when we were all online. Um, from attending these meetings in the past, I. Sometimes I know these questions come up in the chat um, about what is the composition of our whole DE team. So we have a DE coordinator, um, Randy Carver, who I think maybe just had to pop off to head to another meeting, but he has released time. Um, he's also a speech faculty member, full-time faculty member. We have an instructional designer, Monica Landero. She's here somewhere. She also works at CCSF. She's been a part of poker for a long time in our district. Um, one of the, she was the first person to be badged at our college and in our district. So huge shout out to Monica. Um, she's 40% this semester. In the past, we've had two instructional designers at 20%. Um, and so this was this is where we are this semester. And we're thankful she's able to take it on. It makes a lot of sense. And she's super dedicated to our team. We have an accessibility specialist uh, that works with us. She is on contract and really primarily in support of the poker program. But I'll show you how we open that up to the campus as well. Poker lead is me at 20%. And then our poker reviewers, um, which get up to three hours um, for each course review at our other academic service rate. So I'm not sure how every district does it, but we're all, you know, we're paid for our normal, I guess, our normal faculty work, and then we're paid for sort of like the administrative, any administrative work we do. So that's the rate that we're paid at for that. Um, so our poker program itself, um, you know, we do recruitment every year. Really, this is, describes what it looks like in a nutshell. It's four one on one meetings with a mentor. So every participant is paired with one faculty mentor. We really work to pair the mentors with, um, I'm sorry, the, the faculty mentees with someone who is outside of their discipline. So it feels less like an, a, the evaluation process as much as possible. Um, it also helps make sure that the mentor is not getting too far in the weeds into. Um, curricular and pedagogy aspects of the course. Um, so I've reviewed um, speech courses, which actually I love because I was a communications major uh, before I pursued counseling, but um, I've reviewed automotive courses and, you know, things far outside of my area of expertise. And so we really try to do that to, um, like I said before, minimize the feelings of this being kind of an intrusive faculty evaluation process that's tied to our tenure and all those other things. Um, we have four meetings with the entire group um, that are ma uh, mandatory for the mentees. We encourage the mentors to participate. However, they sometimes are not available due to other schedules. Um, but so that's eight total meetings between the one-on-one -on -one and the group in, in the course of a semester. Our accessibility trainings are embedded in those monthly meetings. 
Um, so the mentor, the mentees or participating faculty agree to align their course to the rubrics. We tell them to average about five hours a week. As you all know, um, everyone's coming in at a different level of expertise and experience with course design. Some are brand new and they've met the minimum criteria and others are, are you know, have been doing this for years and need some fine tuning um, or have been doing it for years and need a lot of tuning. So at any rate, we give them that five mark, five hour a week mark. Um, for the alignment and then just explain that after they reach that point, then they will submit to um, the poker lead. We no longer use the district wide review team. We're a, a local certifying college now. So we used to review a part of our three campus district and we had a review team. Um, and that was really great. It was a lot of fun and a great way to work with our colleagues across our district. But now that we are a local certified college, um, each one of us has our own local teams. Um, regarding accessibility, I mentioned they're built into our monthly meetings. So how it's, it's structured is we meet every Thursday, not every Thursday, once a month from one to three on a Thursday afternoon. The first hour is where I facilitate some training specific to um, the CBC and Peralta equity rubrics. We've embedded the Peralta equity rubric in our reviews as well. Um, and the second hour is the accessibility trainings that are open to the campus. So they go on to our flex schedule and faculty can sign up for that. We've had classified sign up for these trainings. We use Canvas um, around our campus for our classified um, and student services areas. So she leads this training for everyone. You don't only have to be in poker, which is wonderful. We also two or three years ago started embedding the accessibility review at the beginning of the poker session. So previously, and that happened actually at, after we became a local certified campus. So we used to do the, you would, the uh, faculty member would work with a mentor, they would get the course to what they believed was perfect alignment, then it would go to the district-wide review team, they might have some um, ideas on feedback, then they resolve those things. Then it went to accessibility. Then there was more feedback. So this time we do a pre-review. So that gives the faculty member and the mentor really some specific things they need to be keeping in mind to remediate with accessibility as they're doing everything else. So it really is a more seamless way. And we're finding people are getting badged sooner because they're understanding those core principles that relate of accessibility specifically for their courses. Um, and it's really working out well, we had one hiccup last semester where a faculty member imported a course and our accessibility reviewer reviewed the entire thing and spent, you know, eight hours or something reviewing the course, gave the feedback, and then the teacher said, oh, did I import that one? Wrong one. So, you know, now we were like, are you sure this is what you want? And so she's changed her approach and how she communicates and does a, a micro. <laughs> review to make sure that they're on track and then she continues before she dives in for eight to ten hours on a, on a review. Um, we also use a canvas shell. I developed a canvas shell. It, I inherited it a little bit of it and then you know we were all meeting in person initially to do all of our poker trainings and then when I became the lead we were fully online and you know in our homes and so i developed this more to mirror what an online course we would want an online course to look like so this is our welcome module um poker is not asynchronous we're still meeting via zoom there's scheduled meeting times etc but this is where faculty and mentors can go back and you know access some of the agreements and you know a reminder wait how do i copy a course into <laughs> into um a canvas shell and you know how can i get started if i'm ready to go early so just some extra resources and additionally of course our poker certified wall of fame that we love to celebrate our new additions to that and i pu push it out to the whole campus but that's kind of where i keep track of our folks also i have it organized by division so it makes it a fun little competition to see if we can um, increase division participation in the program this is just an example of how i organize the our the poker shell for our meetings i put up our agenda and then after we meet i publish the presentation and then any goodies that we reviewed as tips and tricks throughout the presentation i share there as well um this is also too where i'll put any activities and so we you know we talked a little bit about this 
um, in our breakout, um, and this is A2, I know, but just an example of how we're engaging the faculty in our group sessions so that when they are meeting with their uh, mentors one on one, they have some, they can continue to talk about things. So this was an example of um, a sample um you know learning outcomes page and they had to work in groups and figure out how to rewrite these using bloom's taxonomy so that they were would be aligned with meeting the clarity object objectives we find that this is a sticking point on our campus where um, faculty will often conflate the what a student is going to learn in a week and a to-do list so um, this is our effort to help mitigate that issue as it sort of regularly comes up for us um we did develop last year, <laughs> out of necessity, a preview program. Um, so a couple things have happened where there's been some issues with onboarding for a few reasons. Budget is the biggest reason, um, or finding out, getting budget approval, and then being told, well, maybe not. I don't, I'm not sure. We need to think about this more. Um, so last fall, this started, and we decided to continue it for this fall as well, where we're providing a preview program for poker. So we're doing it a little bit differently, where um, it's, I'm spending the fall this semester recruiting folks and onboarding them into poker. We're also finding, because we've been doing this for so long, folks say, I'm so busy, I don't have the time commitment, but if they can commit to this, they're more likely to engage in the spring. So, or at least last year, that was the case. So I'm hoping that's the case for this year as well. I'll let you know maybe uh, in the spring, I can come back and let you know if this worked uh, for round two. Um, but the goal is to provide upcoming participants with a sense of the workload and time commitment, which is always a huge question for folks at our campus, um, and then give them some more time to potentially work on the course. I do not work over the winter break or summer on poker. My release time is only in the academic year. And so a lot of folks are saying, gosh, I just, you know, I have more time during the break. So this allows them that time. Um, and in the spring, we actually got two folks badged. So it's shortened the time for those two people. So basically they import their course into a shell i do a full review of their entire course and i pull out three to five areas that i think they could really um, remediate fairly quickly um, and understand without a ton of training and detail we meet for an hour i give them an option to submit a time card in that space for that hour or tack that into the spring semester um, they have the option to start working on the remediation but that would guarantee them a spot in the cohort for the spring um, so it worked out wonderfully last year and so as your poker programs continue to evolve um, and you get faculty who are saying like i've already done it or i don't know i'm too busy you know consider this as an alternative um, to support folks and even if they don't join the program, they're at least getting a sense of what a high quality course needs to look like and getting that feedback so that they can begin to incorporate some of it. Um, Megan Sweeney from CCSF brought this up in our group about working with hybrid and hybrid is not a part of the poker program, but I did have someone reach out to me last year who teaches, who was, was asked by their department to develop an online um, core, an online shell essentially for their intro to bio course that where the lecture would be online and the lab would be in person. So it would not be poker certified, but they were very interested in these quality practices of the CBC OEI and Peralta equity rubrics. Um, so it was really fun to work with them on this. Um, and, you know, I'm, we were talking about how we can do that better as we're seeing more hybrid classes being offered on our campus. And they do have an online component. So it's not poker, but how can we hmm. leverage the principles of pro poker into this? Um, I did think it was interesting. We did not, poker did not pay for this um, particular faculty member to do this work. His department was paying him um, to develop this online class model for the rest of their department. So it turned out really well. He took all my advice and this class, the online portion is looking, is looking really nice. Um, the other piece that we just talked about a little bit too is the evaluation. So we do not use the poker rubric for faculty evaluations. That's not a part of our collective bargaining um, at this time. Um, but we have also found that there are managers or non-DE faculty who are evaluating folks who have gone through poker and they're not trained and they're, they're marking faculty off. <laughs> um, and this is particularly scary for someone who's going through tenure process or who is part-time and worried about their job in the next semester. So I really um, 
encourage our folks who are going through poker to keep a do not publish module in their courses that are being evaluated that has the you know the poker certification or or even if they're not certified where they are in the process because poker is above and beyond <laughs> in many cases and then with that we've been able to advocate in our district for our uf to be you know kind of requiring managers to go through some training for evaluating online classes and what they need to be looking for especially if they've never taught before in especially in a de situation so something that's something that's happening in our district so just some overall tips um, that you know we've come to since becoming local certified. We allow partially baked courses to go up for review. <laughs> what I mean by that is we used to, when we would go to district-wide review, we'd really want it to be as close as we thought possible, 99%, if not 100% ready to go, and we were still getting feedback. And that was really delaying somebody's time to get to badging. Um, so we agreed locally, you know, let's aim for 75%. And what we're finding is that sometimes the mentor and the faculty member are just tapped and they've looked at the same thing a hundred times and we need fresh eyes. So that allows for that. And then sometimes the faculty member is a little resistant to our advice and our suggestions. So it does allow, I think Sochi, you mentioned that earlier, that third set of eyes to say, no, that you really do need to, to do what, you know, your mentor has suggested. So, um, and it does help move things um, faster. In terms of money, we're being super creative, uh, you know, leave no stone unturned, shake every tree. You know, we ran into a little budget issue this year and Randy, my our DE coordinator, he was turning over a stone one week and I was shaking a tree the next. And so we were just tag teaming back and forth. Um, think about workforce, think about equity, professional development, your foundation, you know, just it's we have to do it, unfortunately, because it's not that HERF money is gone. And that's what was supporting us for the last several years. Um, and then just be creative. Think about other ways that poker can support your campus. Um, you know, my my job description for poker reassignment is very specific to poker only. Um, but we're talking about how can we open that up so I can do more things like supporting hybrid folks who wouldn't go through the full badging and what would that look like and how can we potentially offer compensation or flex credit something so that folks who really want to can can get something for their time. So that is Contra Costa College in a very quick nutshell. Soshi, thank you for um, inviting me today and I'll stop there. Thanks. Sarah, thank you so much uh, for this presentation. Such great ideas and tips. Um, your college looks great. I'm so excited. Um, and I'm excited for people to like get some of those ideas and integrate them into their college. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat for Sarah. Um, we have six minutes left. I'm so glad we we were almost done in in time. I'm very proud of us. Um, okay, let me go ahead and just go back to sharing my screen. So the next next is our survey. I know Marilena has been dropping the link for our survey. So um, before you leave, please please uh, fill out the survey. We do look at um, your comments in the survey and um, we do you know try to adjust these norming sessions to meet your needs. And if any of you are interested in presenting, please let us know in the survey because I'm always looking for presenters. Um, so yeah, survey. And then some reminders. Um, so this, the, the um, recording will be on the CVC at one site. I'm still working on where it's gonna be at, but as soon as I know, um, I'll try to send everyone an email to let them know, but I'll, uh, I plan to post the recording as well as um, the slides. Um, for my slides and the presenter slides as well. Um, poker registration, if you're a poker lead, uh, you get emails with our upcoming poker trainings. Um, it's the date and the registration link. You are the ones that should be sharing those out to your faculty. Sometimes I get emails from faculty saying, I wanna go through the poker training. I always tell them, this is your poker lead, please reach out to them. If you need those dates and registration links, just send me an email and I will send those to you. I have them saved so I can access them very quickly. And if you forget my email, just ask, put, uh, you can submit a ticket, support at cvc.edu and that ticket will come to me and I'll send you that information. And lastly, I encourage you to um, participate in the ACCJC survey for that uh, pilot rubric that they've um, 
um, shared with us and we'll be using as a pilot soon. And then because of our new website, I'm still working on the college dashboards and how to share those with you. So um, coming very soon, there will be an update on the college uh, dashboards and the way I share those out with each of the poker leagues. So just uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, any questions? No, if, if you do, drop them in the chat or unmute yourself. All right. All right. So last but not least, thank you so much for attending. Um, the next norming session is Wednesday, December 11th, 10 to 12. Uh, you will receive an email a month ahead of time of that session. Um, our emails, myself and Maria Lena's email are both uh, on that slide. But if you forget them, again, a ticket to support at cvc.edu will come to me or Maria Elena. Um, and we will answer your questions. I want to thank our presenters for um, giving us all of that information and, you know, being willing to share it with all of us. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, and, you know, if I don't see you sooner, I'll see you December 11th. I'm going to go ahead and stop. And yes, that is the same time, 10 to 12. Yes, 10 to 12 is the same time.